Um, so we have Erin Miska back. Um, and I introduced Erin to everyone yesterday, so I thought rather than going through the introduction again, this is Erin's first time in Australia, so I thought I'd say, well, what have you learned about Australia in your short time you've been here? I got quite the education last night at dinner with Australian phrases. I learned esky and chippy and tinny and sparky and... There's, there's a pattern of here. Yeah. 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 You guys like to have nicknames for each other that end in E. Tucker, I learned in cans. That was great. Yeah. Yep, lots of good swear words I, I heard, yeah. <laughs> tell us, tell us. <laughs> no, I won't say those. <laughs> okay, so, the, so um, I'm going to try and make sure I get the pronunciation of this right. So um, <laughs> it's going to be pseudo Jamf. There you go, yeah. <laughs> An update on Jamf patch management. Thanks, Erin. Thanks. Uh, I'm back. I'm sorry that you have to listen to me twice. It's really expensive to fly Americans out here. <laughs> I tried to get another Jamf to come out here from the States so that you wouldn't have to listen to me twice, but it didn't work. Um, okay, so here I am back again with another title that probably has to be explained, which I said yesterday is a no-no, and I'm doing it again. Um, so some of you may have heard this at um, JNUC this last year in October, but some of you may have not at Jamf, we use Scrum. So we have Scrum engineering teams that are cross-functional. I have people from different parts of engineering, and we all have silly names. And my team that works on Patch is called Argon. Um, and so we've kind of taken a pirate theme, R, um, because Patch, we have patches on our shirt. Um, pretty stupid. So we've, <laughs> we've made up a fake uh, verb that does not actually work, pseudo Jamf, R. Pretty dumb. <laughs> we could make, I've had a lot of requests to make that work. We might need a Jamf Nation feature request. <laughs> um, okay, so with this presentation, for those of you that have been kind of following us on this patch journey and are up to speed with where we're at, I don't want to repeat a lot of things that you already know, but at the same time, there's probably a lot of you that have no idea where we're at. So I'm going to try to do a mix of summarizing where we've been. Um, and then throwing in some new things that you may not know if you have been following us at JNUC and things like that. Um, so we've shown this slide before. Patch management, turns out, is a really big problem with a lot of sub-problems. So this is no small task. Um, so we've kind of tried to help people internally and externally understand the, the different parts that we've broken it down into. We've, we've used this diagram a couple times. Um, so it all kind of centers around um, from our perspective, inventory and understanding what titles are out there versus what you have in your environment. And that's how you identify that there's a, a patch that needs to go out. Um, so inventory is at the center because everything kind of revolves around that. Um, once you've identified a patch, you have to package it up, you have to get it onto your distribution point, and then you actually have to deploy that in a way that doesn't completely ruin your end user's day, but still keeps them secure in a timely manner. And that happens constantly with probably dozens and even hundreds of titles that you all have to keep up with. So it's a lot of work. Um, so at Jamf, we're trying to take a really iterative approach and not try to solve the entire problem at one time, because I think that would be impossible. We're trying to take one small chunk, um, do that decently well, ship it to you guys, get feedback, move on to another chunk, and kind of keep getting feedback and, and making it better as we go. So I think a lot of people are a lot, a lot of people ask me, when will we have full patch management? And they're expecting like a moment where we just dump it on you and it's a big marketing splash and everybody's happy. And I don't know that that moment will ever come because it's going to be iterative. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> um, OK, so, so where we've been. Um, in August of last year, so almost a year ago, we first released um, patch reporting and notifications with the 993. So we finally got to mark Casper Sally's feature request as partially implemented. She loves to talk about, I don't know if any of you know her, she loves to talk about how this is her feature request. Um, so she was pretty excited when we marked this as partially implemented. Um, so since then, we've released over 400 patches. Um, and I had our patch curator run some numbers for me, and that's an average of one and a half per day. Um, so that team is always busy trying to keep up with this stuff for you guys so that you don't have to. Um, so essentially what that release got you is um, for the 40 or so titles that we support, when there's a new patch available, you can get a notification via email or in your JSS so you don't have to be searching for, for patches. Um, and then some, some reporting that we'll, we'll take a look at here. Um, so a refresher for any of you who aren't using this today. Um, it's pretty easy to set up. Like I said, we've got um, almost 40 titles now, and you just pick from the list, and you click that, 
And then you have to choose a couple options, like do you want your notifications in the JSS or via email? Um, some pretty simple stuff. Um, and just like that, you can save your, your title and you get some pretty cool stuff for free right away. Um, some of them do require um, an extension attribute that is kind of built into that title. And that is because we need to make sure that we have really good inventory information to base all of our reports off of. Um, and so some of these titles, it's nice because we, they're just standard applications and so the, the built-in inventory collection in the JSS um, gets us that good information that we need to base all of reporting on. Um, some of them, like Flash Player, they're not a true application, so we're not reporting on those by default. And the best, most reliable way that we know to, to get that good information is to run an extension attribute that, that we have built. Um, so things that you get for free once you um, add one of these titles. So you get um, cataloged info about the title. So we basically are maintaining um, a version history for each of these titles. I think they go back about a year and a half or two years now. Um, and we have information like, when was it released? Um, can you install these out of order? Like, can you skip through them or do you have to install them in order? Um, does it require a reboot? Do you have to close the app before you can install it? Stuff like that that you guys are used to having to kind of figure out on your own. Um, and then this is that report that I talked about. This is what it looks like in, in the nine series. And I've seen, I think yesterday someone had, had their report up and they said, don't look at how to date my, my Google Chrome was. Um, so this is what that looks like today. So you get kind of a nice view of here's the latest version. Here's how you're doing against that version. And then kind of a further breakdown of um, here are all the versions that you have in your environment and what the distribution among those versions looks, looks like. Um, and you get a table of all the computers that can be filtered a little bit. Um, and we can add these to the dashboard. I think that's what um, was shown yesterday. We can export it too and show it to other people in your organization, which is helpful for stakeholders that, like I said yesterday, try as we might, we can't get them to log into the JSS, so we have to export things and email them to them. Um, and here's those notifications. This is the JSS example. So um, when a Google Chrome patch comes out or a patch for any of the titles that you've added, you get that notification either right in the JSS or via email. Um, and then the last cool thing that you get for free when you add these titles today is the ability to do greater less than comparisons in your smart groups. So this is a huge feature request on Jamf Nation, has been for a long time. The reason that we have been slow to just implement it is not that we don't want to, it's that it can be really hard when vendors um, do wonky things with their versioning. I just talked to, I don't know where Duncan is, but we talked for about a half hour about all the weird things that, <laughs> that vendors can do with their versions and that makes it really hard for us to do string comparisons to reliably do these greater than less than calculations. Um, but with Patch, these titles that we support, because we've cataloged the versions, um, we, the, the versions could be called goats and llamas and we could do the comparison. It just doesn't matter what, what they're called. Um, how many of you are using Patch reporting and kind of knew all of this? And this is just a refresher. A couple of people, so I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Um, okay, and then at JNAC 2016, I was wearing this very same shirt on a stage much larger and scarier, and I'm glad I'm not on that stage again, but it was called the Guthrie. Um, so we did a presentation on patch policies. It was basically a sneak peek of what was to come. At the time, we were young and naive, and we thought 10 was just around the corner, so we got everyone all excited, um, but I'm still excited about it because it's going to be really cool. So why are patch policies so cool, and why am I so excited about them? Um, from my perspective, they get you three. They will get you three big things. Um, one is automated scoping for the for patching of the titles that we support. Um, so no need to really maintain those complicated smart groups anymore. The greater than less than thing was kind of a temporary thing. The the long term goal is to take care of that scoping for you. Um, smarter policies. So today, the policy engine that you guys use for a whole slew of things. It can, it's like a Swiss Army knife. It can do a million things. It's not really built for patch. It can do patch, but um, it's kind of complicated to figure out what stuff in there is relevant and what's not. So patch policies are a lot, a lot smarter. Um, and they can take that information that's cataloged about all of the nuances of the title um, and make smart decisions about how to deploy it based on that. Um, and then really um, a big thing that it gets you is a better end user experience for deploying these patches using the new self-service app. 
Um, okay, so some of you that have been keeping up with our patch journey, you might be thinking, I already knew all this, I'm using patch reporting, I saw your JNUC talk, what have you been doing since then? Um, so this is where I would like to try to show you a couple new things that you maybe didn't know um, or that are new since, since JNUC. We got a lot of feedback from people at JNUC. Um, we're always getting good feedback on Slack and Jamf Nation, but there's something about JNUC where um, a thousand Mac admins are in a room together and we get feedback that we never would have gotten otherwise. So it was like an amazing, overwhelming <laughs> amount of feedback from, from people after we demoed patch policies. Um, so we've actually tried to implement some of that. Um, so the biggest thing that we heard, and this wasn't just at JNUC, this is constantly since we released 993, we need the patches faster. Um, we set out to have a target response time of 48 hours. Um, and the first few months that we did this, we hit it sometimes, a lot of times, but not all the time. Um, and um, we heard you loud and clear. So since March, we have made some changes to our deployment process, and 98% of our updates have been deployed in under 24 hours. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but we've gotten good feedback from Slack and Jamf Nation, so um, we're hoping that that meets the mark a little bit better, but it's still a work in progress. We're already always trying to automate more of that process so that we can get um, the patches out faster. And another thing that I've heard is, um, like, 24 to 48 hours is kind of okay to have the patch ready, but why can't you at least tell me right when you find it? Um, so that's a feature request that's kind of towards the top of my mental list is, um, it, it would be fairly easy for us to at least tell you immediately when we find it so that you know Jamf is working on it. Um, this we heard purely out of um, JNUC. I did a small user feedback session at the office, so um, customers that were particularly interested in patch got together at the office. I bought them beer and bribed them with snacks, and they gave me um, feedback, and, and the patch team too. Um, and a big thing we heard was um, a lot of you have been doing this on your own in similar ways that we're trying to automate for a long time. Um, and so we have a lot of experts out in the community that know how to do this pretty well. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but they have a lot of strong opinions on how we should be doing it. And so there was a little bit of skepticism as far as like wanting to know what the heck we're doing behind the scenes and how this is being powered and wanting to understand it so that they can trust it and also give us feedback on it. Um, so we put together this knowledge base article that I hope has helped with that, that basically explains um, here's what happens between the time, well, here's how, here's how Jamf finds the updates and here's what happens between the time that they find the update and the time that it gets delivered to my JSS. And it has um, links to where you can go look at all of our JSON. I was showing um, Duncan how to, how to actually pull up our JSON um, and check that out. So we don't want any of this to be a secret. We want it to be transparent. We want you guys to be able to, to trust it and give us feedback. So hopefully um, check that KB out and see if it helps. Um, another thing we've done, we are constantly trying to add additional titles. Um, I get a lot of questions about like, this is great, but I have 80 titles in my environment and you only support 35. Um, so how, how what, do I, what am I supposed to do about the titles that you don't support? Um, what we would like to do is find the most common titles that are really common across lots of organizations and support those. Um, and then we'll talk about the rest of them in a minute. Um, and so I would encourage you to file feature requests for titles that you want to see supported. We don't know about them. I mean, when we first set out to do patch, I kind of went out and interviewed people, and that's how we arrived at that original list. But now we're kind of going based off of like conversations with people and feature requests. But feature requests really are the best, the best way. Um, so there's, I don't know, there's probably like a dozen out there on Champ Nation, and we've implemented a few of them. So this is the list that we have implemented so far. Um, so we had support for Firefox from the get-go. There were kind of two main problems. The first was that we didn't support Firefox ESR. I didn't realize how many people actually want that, use that purposely and want it patched. Um, so we heard that feedback and added support for Firefox ESR. Um, the second was, even though we didn't support Firefox ESR, we had two different Firefox titles, and I won't even get into why that was, because it's confusing. But basically, the long story short was it was confusing the crap out of everyone, so we took the feedback and just um, put that down to one title. So now we just have one title for regular Firefox and one title for um, Firefox ESR. Um, Skype for Business, that was finally released in the, sometime in the last few months. I don't know if any of you know when that, exactly when that was. I can't remember, but um, we did add support for that. And then 
We had most of the office suite um, supported from the get-go, but one of the things that we were missing to kind of round out that suite was Microsoft Auto Update. Mao, I think some people, the cool kids say Mao. I don't know. Um, so that's our most recent addition. I think just like a month ago we added that. So these were all based on feature requests, so keep them coming, and um, we want to we want to keep adding titles for you guys. Um, better informed decisions. So. Uh, to be a good, a really good product manager, you need good data. Um, and we had some data. We could tell how many um, patches every organization had added. So we could tell kind of like, we could kind of gauge, is this being used heavily or not? We kind of said, if someone has one or two titles, they might just be playing around. If they have like three or four or five, they're probably using it. Um, so that was helpful, but what we really wanted was um, to know if there were any titles that people just weren't using at all, because um, that might mean that that title sucks and we need to change the way that we're um, handling the versioning, or it might mean we miss the mark and nobody actually cares about that title, or maybe like that product was deprecated and nobody cares anymore. Um, so with 999, this is something that you guys will never really see, um, but we added an extra customer experience metric for those of you that um, graciously submit that to us. Um, that allows us to actually see which titles you guys are subscribed to. So long term, that will really help us figure out where to put our resources, which titles people are using most and getting the most value out of. Um, and then, of course, styling, styling, styling. Um, so the patch reporting um, pie chart and table that I showed in a previous slide and that you guys are all used to seeing looks um, very different and much prettier and nicer in 10. Um, I think it just, uh, styling can, it just can go a long way to instill confidence that, that we know what the heck we're doing. <laughs> um, kind of along the same lines, um, reporting looks a thousand times cooler than when we first released it, in my opinion. And um, it looked pretty good at JNUC when we showed it, but there was um, a lot of filtering enhancements that we wanted to make. Um, so we've done a lot of work with the filtering of this table. Um, so you can click just about anywhere on here. Like you can filter from the column, you can filter by clicking these things, you can filter by clicking the pie chart, and all of the other filterable er areas will go along with it. So um, hopefully that should be really intuitive. Um, and then we mentioned this at JNUC, but it is in a new location. Right now it's a little buried, in my opinion, in the 9 series. Um, I think you, you go into your title and then you click a button to see the report. And um, in 10, it's actually the first thing that you see when you go into the title, because um, we have a feeling that that's going to be kind of the most common page that you guys visit within patch management long term. Um, this one is small, but people are, I think, really excited about it. So at JNUC, I had like three or four different customers come up to me after the presentation and say, hey, the self-service stuff looks great with patch. Are you going to have an update all button so that if like I have 10 patches in there, I don't have to sit and click update 10 times? And I kind of said, yeah, it's in our backlog, but I kind of thought that could wait. The feedback that I got is that that's a must have. So we, as, as small as it is, we implemented that. So that's, um, I think, going to be helpful and exciting. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are easy to excite. <laughs> Our developer was like, yeah, I can do that. It'll probably take me two hours. <laughs> um, and then site improvements. So how many people do we have that actually use sites within Jamf Pro? Actually kind of a lot. OK, cool. Um, so in the 9 series, we got a lot of feedback from customers via the support team at Jamf. Um, that the way that we were doing sites with patch reporting was less than ideal. So the biggest problem that we heard was that um, because the patch titles were not citable, if one site didn't give two craps about a title but another did, they, that site that didn't care would still have to see that in their list of patch titles. So it was just kind of confusing and would make them um, think that it was more important than it was. Um, and so we changed that so that the software titles are fully citable um, so if site A really cares about Chrome patches, but site B doesn't, site B doesn't get their list cluttered with, with Chrome things. Um, and then longer term, what that will also allow us um, is that the sites can use different packages. So the way we had it set up, we were going down a path where 
um, all the sites would have to share packages. Um, we already have a lot of places in Jamf Pro where packages are not really site aware, and so we didn't want to further down that path, so we um, tried to make that change early on based on the feedback. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I can't remember who it was, but yesterday in the panel someone said, Jamf just does a lot of stupid things, and we, we do sometimes. I, I don't disagree with you there, but he, the one example that was brought up was um, when I have a bunch of failed policies, I don't want to go in and find them and hit flush logs to get it to retry. Why can't it just retry? We have heard that all over Jamf Nation, so we didn't want to replicate that with patch policies. Um, so we have this feature. Um, it's a settings object that's specific to patch management where you can specify the number of times that a patch policy will retry. Um, so what we went out to the community and we kind of said, so you want things to auto retry, but like how many times? And we kind of got varying answers. And people, I think the general consensus was after it fails a few times, it's probably never going to go. It probably will require intervention. Um, so we just made it customizable. So you, I think the default is like three times it'll auto retry if it fails. Um, and after that, it will finally error out and say, hey, you got to look at this. Um, so hopefully that helps. It's one last stupid thing that Jamf is doing. <laughs> um, okay, so that was kind of maybe a little confusing because I kind of went through the past and the present and then a little bit into the future. Um, so I just want to play a, a video of where our current state is and what you'll be seeing in 10 to make sure that it's, it's clear. Um, so this is not shipped yet, but it will be coming with 10. It's a pre-recorded video that I'm going to kind of talk over. I did some live demos at JNUC and it almost killed me. So I kind of wanted to take VTO and enjoy Australia, so I didn't do a live demo. <laughs> um, OK, so this is the new um, list view of the titles that we've already added. Um, so I'm just going to go into Google Chrome, see if this works. Yeah, OK, cool. So. Like I mentioned, um, straight away, here's another thing that I'm, I learned from you guys. We don't say that in, in America. Straight away, it takes me to the patch report. Um, <laughs> my screen here isn't caught up. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, no need to um, click another, another button to get to that. OK, and then this is a little demo of the filtering that I was talking about, because it was kind of confusing to explain. I can basically click anything on here, and it will do um, some really smart filtering um, and make the other filtering areas align so that it's not super confusing. Um, Cecilia is the name of my cat. Michael is the name of my husband. My demo machines are really creative. <laughs> um, OK, so let's click one of those machines and actually go take a look at the, the patch report from the machine's perspective. So we'll go look at Michael's computer. He was like, you're not going to show my MAC address or anything, are you? <laughs> um, OK, so we go to the Management tab, and then we scroll down to Patch Reporting. So the other patch reporting view that we were looking at was a view um, of a specific title across my entire organization. This is a view of a single computer across um, all of the titles that they have. Um, so you can kind of see how that computer is doing. Michael needs to patch his his browsers. And then we can click View Report to get taken right back to the report. So um, hopefully that saves you guys some clicks. I know you, most people are big on saving clicks. Um, so here we are back at the report. Um, we can see that we only have one machine on the latest version. And if we go to our handy dandy notifications that look a lot prettier than they did in 9, we can see that's because um, a Chrome update came out um, fairly recently. This isn't really recent anymore, but when I made this video, it was recent. Um, so we can see basically based on the report and the notification that we've got some patching to do. So we'll go ahead and close out of the notification. And we will go to the definition tab. Um, so I think a common misconception is that, like I said, in 10, full patch management will be here and we'll be done. Um, that's not the case. Uh, we're, we're really focusing on um, assisting with the scoping and making the end user, end user experience better and having smarter policies 
eventually we know obviously that packaging is a huge part of the problem, but we haven't addressed that yet. So for the time being, what we do is I've already created a package for the latest Google Chrome update, and I've uploaded it to my distribution point, so it's already in the JSS. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm finding that package, and I'm telling the JSS um, for this version in your, your recipe or your definition file, use this package. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and save this guy. And now we're ready to, to deploy it. So, so far the only thing I've had to really do is um, create and upload that package. Um, so here I have the patch policies that I've already pre-created. Um, so typically it's best practice for, we saw yesterday that um, um, patching is one of the, the top um, things you can do to help with security, but typically it's best practice, even though we want to get those patches out quickly to, to patch security vulnerabilities and all that, um, we also want to make sure it doesn't break other things in our environment. Um, Jamf is doing some testing on these patches before we make them available to you, but every environment is different and the tools that it has to work with are different, so we can't do all of that. So it's still definitely best practice um, to kind of stage these. Um, so a common like staging workflow that I've heard is um, that people will deploy it out to like a, the, the IT team first, um, see how that goes, and then if it goes well, I've, I've heard of a lot of people that have um, like a pilot end user group, so end users that have signed up to be guinea, guinea pigs, usually it's like the techier, geekier users that wanna um, get the new updates. Um, so that's what the second patch policy there is. Um, and then the third one is, if all that goes well, we can deploy out to production. Everyone obviously has um, different ways of doing this, but this is kind of a, a common workflow that I see. Um, so the idea with these patch policies is that you can create them once and kind of reuse them every time there's a new patch. So this is not something that you would have to set up constantly. Um, so let's pretend that we already deployed it out to IT and our pilot group and it went well, so we're ready to deploy it to production. So we'll go into that patch policy and see what that looks like. Okay, so here we basically just have a title, and then the target version dropdown is kind of the where the money is. That's kind of the key to all of this. Um, so right now it's set to target the previous Chrome version from the last time I patched this group. Um, but what we're going to do is actually switch it to the latest version and then we have it set to deploy via self-service. So we'll switch the target version, which is tied to that package that I just told it to use. Did it go? I don't know if it went. Sorry, my screen is like one behind. I don't know why. It went. Okay. Okay, so now we'll look at the scope tab. Um, this is also where the money is. So um, this is traditionally where you guys would have um, a complicated smart group that you would plug in um, so that you're identifying all the computers that are eligible for this, that need it, um, and we're trying to do some of that heavy lifting for you. So this list right here was um, not something that I created, it was something that the JSS figured out for itself. So it identified all of the computers that need this patch and are also eligible for it, so it's not going to try to scope out to computers that don't meet the requirements for it. Um, so as far as scoping, the only thing I really need to do is kind of refine that scope. Um, so because this is my production group, I don't really have to refine it at all, and I'm just going to push it out to everyone that was in that eligible list. Um, for the IT test group, or like the pilot group, I might use a static group of those guinea pig users, or a static group of my IT staff, or if I have like an LDAP group of the IT staff, I could use that. And then we'll take a look at the user interaction tab where we configure um, how all this looks to the, the end user. Um, so this first section in the tab is pretty standard, what you guys are used to in most deployable objects. Um, just configuring the way that it looks to the end user, the icon and the title and all that good stuff. And then when we get down to the notifications and reminders, this is kind of how you get to nag your end users a little bit. Um, we're being nice by putting it in self-service and letting them kind of decide the best time to, to install it. We're not forcing it on them. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that they know it's there, um, remind them that it's there, uh, and then ultimately enforce a, a deadline that we'll look at in a second. 
So down at the bottom, we have deadline and grace period. So this is, um, we've told them it's there, we've reminded them um, once every day, but after seven days, I'm done being nice and I'm gonna force it on them. Um, if I force it on them and see that there's user interaction required, I don't wanna just shut their apps immediately. I wanna maybe be nice and give them, say, 15 minutes. Um, so we can say, after seven days of reminding them, um, try to force the update. If you can't because they have apps open, give them this nice message that says you have 15 minutes. So we will save this patch policy. So really, um, I kind of gave you a tour of the patch policy, but basically all we've done so far is um, create the package, upload it, tell it that it goes with this version, and then switch the target version in the patch policy. Um, so now, just really quick, we'll take a look at the end user experience side of this. So I've got my fancy branded XWorld self-service. Um, and we're gonna stare at the dock and up top where Notification Center tells me stuff. I don't know if this is playing or if I have to hit play. I must have to hit play. This works. Okay, so my um, badge incremented by one, and then I got a nice branded notification that looks like my organization, XWorld, that told me I have a patch available. And then I got to use my um, fancy dancy, I'm a, I'm a good end user, so I right away went in and clicked my update all button, um, and this is where it ends. I didn't actually um, create successful packages here. But um, so, they can at least see in here, if they don't want to do it now because they have Chrome open and it's telling them they have to close Chrome, they can see in here um, that their deadline is, um, they, they see the date of the deadline. And that's calculated per computer because it's based off of um, an amount of time since the patch was made available to them. So that could vary depending on when the computers fell into scope. Um, and if I had um, Google Chrome open, when I clicked that, that button, it would have popped a nice reminder thing out that says, hey, it says you have to close Chrome and you didn't close Chrome, so, so do that and try again. Um, so that's what the end user side looks like. And there's, um, we didn't really go through the, the non-self-service distribution method, but there's, there's other ways to do this. That's just kind of the best practice that we're recommending. Um, okay, so we still have tons of ideas to expand on this and make this better. We have, um, uh, we're excited to keep making this easier for you guys, so what's next? Um, so back to our handy dandy diagram, we have taken care of inventory and identify with 993, and, and I don't want to say taken care of because there's still a lot of things we can do to make that better, but we at least, at least have a start um, to those parts of the problem. Um, and then patch policies that we just kind of focused on is really the that apply step, and again, things we could do there to make that better. So what's left is kind of the package and the upload. Um, so that leads me to the packaging problem. That's really our next um, huge chunk of work. Um, we are still in the early stages of deciding how we want to solve that problem. What I would like to see is, um, I've told a couple of you this week, on the one hand, we have a lot of users that are using Auto PKG for this and are very happy with it, and we, if they're happy with it, we're happy, so we want them to be able to um, continue using that. And so I think there's some small things that we could do to make it a little easier to take those packages and get them into the JSS and get them into these patch policies. Um, I think like small API endpoints and things like that could, could make that a lot easier. Um, so that I think will help a lot of you and be kind of an easy win. On the other hand, we have a lot of users that um, for varying reasons are not open to using open source software, either like their boss thinks it's scary and they don't understand um, or they, they just want Jamf's stamp of approval on it or their boss is saying, we bought the Cadillac of Mac management, why do I need to use free open source tools? There's a lot of reasons, but we have a lot of users that that's just not an option for them. Um, so for them, th that's gonna be a lot more work for us to solve that problem, so we'll be um, probably building something for the ground, from the ground up for them. Um, and then once we have the, the packages automatically created either through auto PKG integrations or something that um, we built for, the, for those other customers, um, that's when we get to, can get to the point of a fully automated, that cycle can kind of be fully automated. So um, imagine that um, you have your JSS set to, ooh, it turns green, I didn't notice this yesterday. 
Um, you have your JSS set to automatically deploy Chrome patches when it identifies them. So you could, if Chrome like release something in the middle of the night, which it probably does for you guys because it's happening <laughs> in the United States, um, you could wake up to see that it was already pushed to your IT group and the IT group is already, is already testing away and after three days, if you don't come in and press a big red button, it will advance to that, that, um, that other staging group. And again, if, if, if that goes well, it'll automatically advance to, to production. So once we have the packaging part um, kind of solved, we, there's a lot of automation we can build in. Um, we will definitely make that optional because a lot of people are not comfortable with that le level of automation. We know that. Um, test stages I kind of talked about. Um, release tracks. I've talked to a couple of you about that. So like I said, um, the packaging problem is the next big thing, but there's small things that we can go back and do to, to reporting and patch policies to make better. One of those is release tracks. Turns out when you um, call the absolute latest version of something, the latest version, a lot of customers will ring you and say, um, that's not the latest version for us because we're on the more conservative track and we don't even want to think about deploying that yet. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're learning a lot about these vendors and how they version these things. Um, so this was something that was a little bit new to us. So I would like to um, see us build in something where if you choose a title, you, you add a title that actually has tracks, we ask you which track your org is using and we base all your, your reporting and your scoping off of that. Um, Okay, so I said we would get back to this. So we want to use your feature request and your input to build our um, library of patch titles so that we have support for a lot of the really common ones, but we're never gonna be able to do them all because there's so many that vary across orgs. Um, so for that, we would really like to open source our definitions and allow you guys to, um, to contribute to that. So I kind of, kind of my vision for that right now is um, there's the set of JAMP titles that you can, they have the JAMP stamp of approval, you can trust them. Um, and then maybe there's like a certification course or something like that where people from the community can become certified. So those have a stamp, a stamp of approval on them too that says, yep, Rich Trotten or whoever that's really well known in the community, he did this. So um, Rich is gonna probably email me and say, what, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> um, so kind of like a second tier of of trustworthiness. Um, and then the third would be, like, we don't know who this guy is, but he created this, so if you want to look at it and it looks good to you, you can use it. Um, I definitely want to make sure that Jamf has our ducks in a row and has our, our definition format really well figured out before we let this open in the wild. Um, and then, obviously, we don't support any built-in Apple titles right now, including the, the OSs, and that was just mostly because what we heard from from the community was that the third party stuff because of the, the extra packaging step was um, a kind of a bigger pain in the butt. So that's where we started, but I think a lot of this, at least the, the experience of it and the, the UI can be um, applicable to Apple titles as well. I tried to find, we have a cool picture of my cat like coding Basically, she's like sitting next to a Mac and there's code on the screen. I tried to find that because I was jealous of all your, your end slides, but this was the best I could come up with. So thanks for listening to me again, and I can take a couple of questions. Okay, thanks very much, Erin. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got time for, for a couple of quick questions. So um, does anybody have any questions about what they've seen? The notification that you showed can you get that to stay there, or is that automatically disappear after 15 seconds, or? Um, on the end user's machine? Yes. That, so that's using um, APNS in the, the native notification center. Um, a lot of the other stuff that Jamf has done in the notification center is not natively, it's not really using APNS, it's kind of spoofed a little bit, but this is actually, the self-service notifications actually use APNS, which is um, good and bad. Like yes, the, yesterday we talked about the goods and the bads of APNS. Um, the, the bad thing about that is we don't really have control to make that, that stick on the screen. If we, we, I think the most we could do is we could switch it so that the default is for it to be what's a banner instead of a, I don't know, you can play around with the notification center settings, but the problem with that is the end user can change it. So yeah, that's one of the challenges with using notification center. Uh, so really kind of two questions, and one of them's a joke question, so it's <laughs> fine. Um, the real question, um, so with uh, the tracked releases, is it possible to use, say, uh, with Microsoft where you can do that, those early release tracks, um, is it set up so that you can use those as well? Or? That's definitely the goal, yes. Perfect. Yeah. 
And and the joke question was with the fully automated deployment, is there literally a big red button to, to like <laughs> stop it all? There's not literally a big, big red button. We were, we're kind of thinking like you could go in and disable the patch policy. If your pilot end users find some big issue, you can kind of pause the whole thing and yeah. Now uh, we can maybe make it red. It could look like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Yeah. What language does my cat code in? Java. What language does your cat code in? Java. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't really, she just sits on my husband while he codes and he writes Java. <laughs> okay, well thanks very much. Cool, thank you. That was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you.